Hello and welcome to Eating Now Hangouts with me, Ankita Saxena. Well, you must have heard of many influencers and podcasters who built their own uh, brands before starting out on their entrepreneurial journey of building products and services. But this podcaster today on our show started out on his investment journey through his podcast. And today we are going to talk to him about his investment journey and also about syndicate investments. Uh, joining us today is Jeevraj Singh Sachar, who is one of the most prolific podcasters building the Indian Silicon Valley podcast. He is also the general partner in ISV Capital, an early stage startup investing syndicate with a portfolio of 30 companies and an AUM of $5 million. He is also a venture partner at the Tribe Capital India, a $100 million venture fund starting in India of the global flagship Tribe Capital, backer of 13 unicorns. He also leads the startup projects at uh, Masters Union, a leading new age business school in India. Hi, uh, Jeevraj. Welcome to ET Now Hangouts. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Likewise, thank you so much for hosting me. I'm very excited to do this and thanks for having me, Ankita. But usually, Jeevraj, you are the one who's hosting people on your podcasts. Uh, you're a content creator, a podcaster who started out on your content creation journey that led to your investment journey. So content creation led to investments. Uh, tell us how did you get started about that? Sure. I'm usually on the other side, so this is right. going to be an interesting one for me. Um, I actually, when I started, the idea was very simple. I wanted to understand how Indian companies are getting built. Mm -hmm. Everybody was throwing around the words of entrepreneurship, startups, but it was not as popularized back then. I started in 2021. Uh, and I, as a person from Calcutta with very little network, wanted to know how these companies are being built if I wanted to build one. Um, so the vision was very nascent at the time. Mm -hmm. But then I got into the ecosystem. I started working at AngelList. And I realized that there's a world of, you know, investing as well. Yeah. Uh, and in investing, especially in early stage startups, it doesn't matter how much capital you have. What matters is do you have the right access? And because of my podcast and what I was trying to do with that, it helped me build a lot of credibility. So I started getting into the best rooms, started hanging out with the best minds in the ecosystem. Yeah. And they, by extension, started telling me about interesting startups coming up. Yeah. Uh, and that's when I realized, okay, my leverage is going to be access. My leverage is going to be my network. My leverage is going to be my credibility. Uh, and utilizing all of that, I realized if I do good quality work, which is in depth with the podcast, combine that with my network, I can start investing in startups as well, right. which is when I started my investing journey. Yeah. Uh, and it's been a lovely, lovely one. I've learned so much. Uh, we now invest in 30 companies. I've done 200 podcasts. Uh, and I absolutely love my day to day because it's such a rewarding journey. You get to interact with such incredible people either on the podcast or get to invest in them. Yeah. Uh, and it's absolutely fun. So very grateful yeah. to be here. Right, Jiran, we'll talk more about uh, your investing journey. But uh, tell me something that you know most people in India at least believe that uh, you know investments are done by institutional investors or VCs uh, or funds. Uh, what is syndicate investing to put things into perspective, and how sure. is it different from retail investing? Sure. So, so basically, when a company gets started, a founder initially does not require mammoths of capital. Yeah. It's probably a couple of crores. And this usually used to earlier come from these angel investors. Yeah. But now a lot of people in the ecosystem have made some capital, either via secondaries, either because of these IPOs, Somato, all of that. Uh, so we've now seen these crop of angel investors who have small ticket sizes. Uh, so I want to invest 10 lakhs in a company, but the founder says that these 10 lakhs are not enough. So they come with a combined vehicle. Okay. This combined vehicle is a syndicate. And a lot of people who have capital don't necessarily know the right startups coming up. So what I do is basically I get to know of the best startups coming up. I get to know how much they are raising. And then I say, okay, I can invest maybe a crore, one and a half crores in the company that will come from 20, 25 people, which makes it easier for everyone to not invest all of their savings in one company, but to invest five to 10 lakh rupees uh, into singular companies, into different, different uh, build a portfolio. And that is what a syndicate is. So syndicate, unlike a fund, is deal by deal investing, where a lot of investors come together and participate to invest in one company. So that, that's the benefit. You can choose which companies you want to invest in. You, I, as a GP, can prove my track record. Instead of coming to an investor and being like, hey, give me five crores, I'll put it in companies by myself. 
I'm getting you a company and being like, hey, do you want to invest 5 lakhs, 10 lakhs, 15 yeah. lakhs? So that becomes the comfort of syndicate investing. Yeah. Uh, institutional investing or retail investing is very different. Uh, if you're an angel, you have to know the founder who's starting up. Yeah. They'll probably take 25 lakhs or above as a single check on their cap table. So all of those nuances make it more difficult. Uh, this just democratizes the access to capital. As the India story goes, I mean, if, if we have to participate in early stage startups, we need such vehicles to help you invest in them. So I think that becomes the benefit. Uh, and I'm, the, I'm trying to bridge that gap with founders and investors. Right, that's that's great story. But uh, we spoke about the benefit. What about the risks involved there? Sure, angel investing is super risky. I think yeah. uh, many people say that you you should invest the money that you are happy because to Because why lose. wouldn't somebody invest in a listed company with a previous price history and you Correct. know that's that's the that, that's the catch. Yes. Yeah. No, if you have limited capital and if you want to grow your wealth specifically, I think you should go for retail investing into the public markets. Angel investing is more suited to people who are familiar with the startup ecosystem, who are okay taking higher risk, who want to contribute to the India story. And and still you should only do it with 5 to 10% of your net worth at max. Even not even net worth, maybe savings, because this is extremely risky. So that goes without saying. Also, I think in some of these things, you don't have incomplete information. Like like nobody when they were investing in Zomato, Flipkart, Swiggy were sure that these companies would become the ones they have or become mammoth successes. Yeah, of course. You have to deal with so much ambiguity. You have incomplete information. So you have to take a lot of significant risk without having complete information. Mm -hmm. So being okay with that is an absolute skill, like dealing with that ambiguity. Mm -hmm. So you have to know that you are okay with that. You have to trust uh, GPs, general partners who know their stuff. Uh, and that's why I think people like hopefully me and others in the ecosystem can tell you which are the good assets to invest in and generate returns in the ecosystem. Right. We'll talk more about that, how to attract the right LPs and you know the right partners because you need to raise capital also to invest. Absolutely. Right? We'll talk about that. But let me come to this point of you know most of the content creators who have been on the show and otherwise that I've interacted with, uh, you know they have been building uh, their brands, they have been building distribution through social media influencing and then getting into you know uh, coming up with their own brands, their own products and services. This is one of a kind starting to invest in companies yeah. through building distribution. How does one go about that? Yeah, no, that's very interesting. Yeah. When I started, I knew very little about distribution myself uh, because <clears throat> every time I've also thought about content creation, it feels like large scale distribution is what you want to aim for. Uh, 1 lakh followers, 500k, 1 million, whatnot. Uh, but in my case, quality distribution has worked. Like I have done the podcast for future founders, future operators, future investors, which means all of the ecosystem, Series A plus founders also watch and tune into my podcast, which really, really helps. Uh, as a result, I think what's helped me is create this quality base of people that I've been able to not monetize uh, through a product, but build credibility on top of and gain access of. So a lot of the deals that I've won, by the way, where I wanted to invest, uh, the founders have been welcoming because, you know, they've liked my work. They've oh. seen a podcast of mine. Uh, they've seen that I interact with good people. They've taken a ref of mine from a podcast guest mm -hmm. and they've spoken highly of me. And yeah. that matters. So I think uh, I, I really think people should take a unique perspective to what they can do well. Like if I would have thought, okay, how can I build the largest business podcast or business channel, I probably would have done other things. But I always thought, okay, if I can do deep work, uh, I can do credible, good conversations, it would lead to something. Many of the, by the way, podcast guests on my show have become investors for me. So yeah. it translates into many, many amazing things. Uh, and that's, I strongly recommend like building quality and knowing your area of competence. Yeah. If your area of competence is building distribution, go ahead and do that. You can then probably build a product on top of it. Yeah. But mine was quality conversations and that's led to a lot of network credibility and thus capital. Right. So let's talk about quality versus quantity. Uh, yes. How do you build quality content versus, as you mentioned, that quantity or number of likes and comments are no longer important to you. But that yeah. is somehow uh, has become a metric of success, success. for most yeah. people, right? Absolutely. I think in a world of clutter and in a world of like, you know, just competing, yeah. we all chase the highest numbers. Um, I think you need one thing that I might want to mention is I'm not dependent on my content career to at least like grow me professionally uh, because I've had other sort of means. I was at Angelist before, now I invest. So that is a luxury to have. If you're only doing content, I do think numbers are important. For me, what's worked is I've realized that, hey, if I build quality, other things will follow uh, because sometimes quality and quantity don't go hand in hand. Uh, what 
a lot of the masses want to know is not what uh, maybe will interest us, right? Like in some shape or form, because we want to look at more mature content. Uh, and we've seen this play out in the US, I think. The US podcasters do a lot of like, Lex Friedman does like six, eight hour podcasts yeah. and people watch uh, because that's the kind of niche he's been able to carve out. People like Tim Ferriss, others, they have set the benchmark really well for me. Uh, so I think the way I've looked at it is, uh, if I do quality work, enough people will take notice. Why Combinator says make, you know, thousand loyal fans as opposed to 100, like uh, a lakh uh, customers. Fan, yeah, yeah, exactly. You don't want to do that. So I always believe catering fans, people who tune into my podcast, they're waiting every week uh, yeah. for what I'm launching. And I'm very, very grateful for that. Yeah. So I do think that if you do good work, it gets noticed. Uh, how you want to do that good work is uh, dependent on you. But it does not necessarily mean or equate to larger amount of followers because that is a very vanity metric in today's world. If you have like 10,000 really good people following you, higher income order, higher good cities, etc., good backgrounds versus let's say a lakh, uh, but not, you know, not a payable audience, not very uh, well versed with the business world. I don't know if that's a trade-off I'm willing to make. Okay. Jeevraj, you have interacted with, through your podcast, you have interacted uh, with the best minds in the business, so whether it is the investors or the startup founders. A lot of young audience that uh, watches our show, uh, there yeah. are a lot of startup founders watching us. Uh, tell us uh, what have been your learnings uh, through these great minds. If somebody wants to get started on their journey, what are the prerequisites? Yeah, no, I think I have so much respect for startup founders yeah. now and their energy is so contagious, right? Yeah. They are, I think... Uh, the, the best folks who create this asymmetrical value like Zomato's now is the yeah. great example that we're all seeing uh, but I have massive respect for them so I'm, I want to start there that if you're choosing to become a founder a huge kudos to you for just choosing to do that yeah. I do think what I've learned is it's a tough journey like yeah. two three points that stand out for me is startup founders have this uh, constant uh, you know risk-taking ability that does not get impacted by the daily highs and lows because as a startup founder the highs and lows are massive uh, like one day you have to like fire so many people one day you'll get this funding of like hundreds of millions of dollars so it's a whirlwind of emotions I've seen startup founders remain constant in their journey like I spoke to a unicorn founder over coffee at 8 30 on a Tuesday mm -hmm. and he was still checked into his business right like he was still thinking about yeah. what to do either the next day or in an hour yeah. and it was massively inspiring yet also you need this sense of obsession so if you don't have that positive obsession yeah. in you uh, or you can't take this whirlwind of yeah. emotions I don't think the startup life is perhaps for you uh, the other thing is that starting up comes with a lot of trade-offs I don't think we realize that but we glamorize like startup founders yeah. at the end right like there's such a successful like survivorship bias as they call it yeah. uh, so many of the survivor companies are what we are looking at when looking at it when they are successful yeah. but what what we should study is actually the six eight ten years 15 years it takes yeah. to get to that point yeah. if you're not if you're not willing to spend that time to get there yeah. I don't think it's worth it uh, and that comes at the trade-off of health family uh, time with friends uh, a lot of personal life if you're not willing to make certain trade-offs in life I I'm not sure if the startup life is for you. And that's something I've heard from many, many founders on the show. And I think the last one is, which is obvious, you have to have this sense of, uh, not vision, but this energy, this optimism yeah. in you, the people's person, because you are selling almost always, right? You're selling yeah. to investors, customers, within the company, to your employees, yeah. to your own self also, because you have to keep yeah. yourself motivated. If you don't have that sense of positive obsession, optimism, I think it becomes really difficult. So I think these are things that stand out. And every time I think about, you know, starting up at some point, I remind myself, if I'm not willing to make these trade-offs, if I'm not obsessed to the point where my night's sleep is gone. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if it's for me. Well, hold that thought, Jeevraj. Uh, with that, it's time for us to slip into a short break. But you don't go anywhere because after the break, we're getting you lots more on this conversation.